welcome you to another session in our series of discussions on the doctrine and teachings of the Book of Mormon. Our specific topic this session is the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I should mention that this is the first in two sessions that will cover uh, the doctrine of the atonement. Joining us for this session are colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. To my right, Professor Avram Shannon. To my left, Professor Jan Martin. And to my far left, Professor Eric Huntsman. It's nice to be with uh, the three of you as we look uh, at this most important doctrine, perhaps we could even say the core doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I guess the first thing that occurs to me, or first question, is regarding the English word atonement. Um, the, the word atonement occurs, I think, in the first time in the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi chapter 2, Lehi's great instruction to his son Jacob. But uh, Jan, I know that you have done significant work on the English Bible and uh, English vocabulary words that are part of our theology. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the word atonement. Well, the word atonement, if you break it up into its little parts, is at one meant. And it basically means to bring two different things together into a unity. Yeah. And uh, William Tyndale, the first man to translate the Bible from English or into English from the Greek source text and the Hebrew source text, is given credit for inventing that word. And unfortunately, that's not that accurate. <laughs> he, he didn't invent the word. We see the word at one in 13th century uh, writings. We also see it, uh, the one meant concept in the 15th century. And then amazingly, Sir Thomas More actually uses the word atonement in his history of Richard III in 1517. Uh, and so Tyndale didn't make up the word. The thing that Tyndale deserves credit for is the theological meaning that he has given to atonement and being wise enough to put it in the scriptures as a good representative for the Greek term as well as the Hebrew term in the Old Testament. I don't know that we always give the Book of Mormon as much credit for the importance of atonement in our theological vocabulary. I think when Joseph Smith was bringing forth the Book of Mormon by the power of God, Joseph and the Spirit together seem to have sensed the broad semantic range or possibility of atonement because it appears 24 times in the Book of Mormon. As Avram and Andy will tell us, it's all over the Old Testament, I think 69 times. Only once in our KJV New Testament, three times in the Doctrine and Covenants, once the Pro Great Price, but 24 times in the Book of Mormon, where we find out it's a lot more than just reconciliation. It's everything that Jesus does to make us one with the Father, like the Father. And one other thing before we look at the Hebrew roots of this, I think sometimes as Latter-day Saints, when we're trying to find common ground with our friends of other Christian denominations, we'll often say, well, we believe in the atonement. We believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if we always realize how foreign that sounds to them, unless they're theologians and they specialize in atonement theory. I think most Christians simply say, Jesus suffered and died for me. When you say atonement, they're thinking Leviticus or something. Um, but for us, it encapsulates so well what it means when we talk about everything that Jesus did for us, which included a lot of the Old Testament senses, right, Andy? It, it does. When you talk about a wide range of semantic meanings, you're talking about the Hebrew. The Hebrew root is kafar. And it means so much more than just reconciliation. I think, Avram, you, you can tell us about that. Absolutely. It, I mean, it has notions that reconciliation is certainly there, but I mean, the core meaning of the root is just to cover. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it's used, for example, in um, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the gold thing that covers the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim on top, that KJV has mercy seat. Um, it comes in the same root. Kaporet means it's the covering thing. So it's covering the top covering of the Covering the top of it. But it's translated as mercy seat in part to try and get a sense of this connection to Hebrew kafar. One of the meanings that comes from the Hebrew word kafar that I really appreciate is the price of ransoming a life. Mm. And I love that imagery as Jesus Christ ransoms us from sin, death, hell, the devil, all of the other real enemies of uh, humankind. So that is comprehended in that term, kafar. 
So it's a, it is really, uh, for me, it's a wonderful word. And of course, uh, most of uh, members of our audience would recognize um, part of the root in the Hebrew word for Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, right. which is um, a very, very important, perhaps the most important of the sacred holidays of the Jewish people. So. But maybe one of the things we can do to start out is to look at a, a slightly earlier text in the Book of Mormon, which really stresses the personal nature of the atonement, that the atonement is something that an infinite and eternal being, Jesus Christ, God made flesh needed to do for us. You know, I was, I was stirred by something President Nelson said a couple of conferences ago when he really encouraged us to stop talking about just the atonement. Like the atonement was this isolated thing, this abstract, you know, ethereal vending machine in the heavens, you put in the faith and the repentance and out you get the salvation. He said, call it the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's something that a person, Jesus, did for us. And that seems to be so clearly illustrated to me in 1 Nephi 11. Our readers and our listeners will immediately recognize this as, as the great vision that the prophet Nephi has. When he asked the Spirit, asked the Lord in prayer, to explain the earlier dream that Lehi had had. This is the famous tree of life dream. And so the angel says, what do you see? He says, I see a virgin, verse 15, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. And then the angel says, knowest thou the condescension of God? And this is such a great word, right? It comes from the Latin, to come down and be with, and usually connotes a superior coming down and being with inferiors. And, and what we see next, and of course, Nephi doesn't really quite understand, right? I mean, this is such a great passage. The Spirit says, you know what the condescension is? And Nephi says, well, I don't know that, but I know God loves his children. <laughs> that's but that's right. exactly the point. That's the point. God so loves the world that he sends his Son. And so the condescension is really in two ways. Right, exactly. It's God the Father coming, coming down, down to be the, the Father. father so of, that Christ will be the only begotten. Exactly. And then it's Jesus Christ, the second aspect of condescension, because he's leaving his godly throne to come down and be like one of us. Because you brought up verse 16, knowest thou the condescension of God, and he says, I don't. But then you look at verse 26. Exactly. And you see this, behold the condescension of God. So we've got the baby thing going on. We get this divine descension from heaven down to earth to become this child. But once he becomes an adult, he's still condescending right. to associate with us and do all of these things that he either doesn't need to do, baptism in that sense of being forgiven of sins, or having to put up with the judgments of men. I find this really interesting that, uh, that Nephi has the same vision as his father had because later on it becomes apparent that Lehi is very, very concerned about the trajectory of his sons. He wants them to stay on the path, but he's also concerned about his really good son, Jacob. And, uh, and if we look at 2 Nephi chapter 2, turn there, um, the context of this is, of course, is that uh, Lehi and his family, his, his larger group now, have landed in the new world and they're getting settled. And he takes the opportunity to teach Laman and Lemuel. Um, about their errant ways, and he says, please don't rebel anymore, and please don't murmur anymore, especially against your brother Nephi. And then chapter 2 is his instruction and his counsel to Jacob. And one, after reading chapter 2, one comes away with the impression that, yeah, Lehi is worried about Laman and Lemuel because they're rebelling, but he has a concern with Jacob for exactly the opposite reason. Jacob is so good, mm. Jacob is so righteous, Jacob is so upright that he even encounters the glory of the Lord while he's in his youth. Yeah. And Lehi, uh, Father Lehi says to him, look, it's not your righteousness that will redeem you. You'll get redemption and you'll be blessed because of the afflictions and some of them because of the rudeness of your brothers, but it isn't your righteousness that will do this. It's the righteousness of the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. And then he starts talking about the law. And he says, the, the law can't justify you. The law, by the law, no flesh is justified. This is 2 Nephi 2, verse 5. And he says, rather, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth, just as Nephi saw and just as Lehi had seen earlier. 
And then Lehi says, he offer, verse 7, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And I, I, I stop there every time and marvel because I think we all have the image of Jesus' suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross at Golgotha, but perhaps bringing that down to our level, it seems to me we're being asked to offer up the exact same things that Jesus Christ offered. Jesus Christ offered a contrite spirit, or let us say a crushed spirit, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he died of a broken heart or a ruptured heart on the cross. And so the very things that Jesus did for our salvation are the very things that the Lord turns around and asks us to offer. He doesn't want any more blood sacrifice, not the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and turtle doves, but I want you to offer the same thing that the Savior offered. So in a way, we become similitudes of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. I, 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 or as Paul would say, we're participating with him, that kind of participation model of the atonement. Avram, Annie mentioned ends of the law. I know you're really familiar with, with the Hebrew Bible. As, as a Hebraist, how do you read that when it says it answers the ends of the law? What is law in the context out of which Lehi and Nephi came? Well, this is a great question because one of the things that's important as we read the Book of Mormon and, you know, and we think about, especially until Jesus comes, of course, is that they're living the law of Moses throughout. Even as they have the specific knowledge and revelation about Jesus Christ, they continue to live the law of Moses. And in fact, Jacob is going to be a priest. Right. That's his job. He, works with the, he will work with the law every day of his life um, as, he, as he teaches the people and does these things. And so I think on the one hand, it's really important to recognize this notion that, then this is of course the human predicament, you know, it's kind of what 2 Nephi 2 lays out here. By the law, no flesh is justified. Whatever, and actually this is important for, I think, for Latter-day Saints as well. Being obedient, keeping the commandments, keeping mission rules, any number of these things is not what saves you. You're saved by Jesus Christ. And I think partially what's going on here in particular is that Lehi is reminding Jacob, as a priest, that you're going to be working with this law every single day of your life. And this law is a good thing. This is God's law. In 3 Nephi 15, Nephi, Jesus Christ says, he says, I gave that law. It's my law. I am the lawgiver. But you don't want to mistake, again, the, the famous thing about, you know, map is not territory. The law can be a map back to God, but it's not territory. Jesus Christ and our relationship with Heavenly Father Jesus Christ, that's territory. And so this is in some ways, I think, as he's teaching Jacob to teach the people then about the atonement of Jesus Christ, about what Jesus Christ did. He's saying, this law is good, and you're really great. You're, you, know, you said you're, you're a good son, I'm good. but that's not it. Well, it's interesting. You know, Paul will, like Lehi and Nephi, will come out of this Jewish context. Yeah. In Romans, Paul just makes it clear that the law is telling you you're a sinner, right? Yes. So the law says, thou shalt not kill. If you kill, you're a sinner. If you don't kill, well, then at least on the positive side yeah. of it. So really what law is doing is showing us our need for Jesus. Exactly. Because every time we've transgressed it, we are sinners. It's the obedience doesn't save us. The obedience means we're not a sinner in that regard, yes. but we still need the grace. And I love the fact that Andy set this up yeah. as an example of here's Jacob, a good dude but he still needs Jesus. Was it Bruce Hafen who says the atonement's not just for sinners? Yeah, you know, well, because the atonement, as we're going to yeah. see, is not just about overcoming our sins. It's healing us. It's making us one with the Father. Well, do you know what's interesting to me is here he is encouraging his son, who is very good and has seen Jesus Christ, to not rest on his laurels and think that that's all that he needs to do. But something I find really interesting is in the previous chapter, chapter 1, in verse 15 of Second Nephi, where Lehi bears his testimony that even he has had his soul redeemed from hell, and he has been encircled eternally in the arms of Christ's love. And he's concerned about Laman and Lemuel there, who are not partaking of the atoning power, and then looking at another son who seems to understand it better, but still, no matter how good he is, we all have to have that testimony that we have been redeemed and are continually being redeemed as we go through and that feeling good about what we do is nice, but that isn't 
and it matters. isn't what we do, frankly, that yeah. saves us. Not it's the merits yeah. and mercies of Christ alone. And and, yeah. and I um, propelled ahead to Second Nephi chapter 25 and those magnificent verses, starting with verse 23, where Nephi says. For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, which right. we've been talking about. Yeah. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. And uh, I, I don't think that, that theoretically it's possible for any of us to do all that we could do. No. It's simply not possible. No. And so I read this as a preparation of separation. That is to say, we're saved apart from anything yeah. we, can yeah, we can do. Which is a legitimate way of reading after all we can do. And I like to connect that verse 23 to the, to the do over here in 29. Because Nephi's trying to be so plain and he says, if ye do this, well, what this is he talking about? Well, right before that he said, you must bow down before him, which is what Christ did in the garden and on the cross, worship, his father with all of his might, might and strength and his whole soul. He really poured all of that out when he completed the atonement. And so here's Nephi going, you do have to do this same thing that Jesus did. And if you can do that, and I connect it over to verse 26, then you can obtain this remission. Now let me just clarify what you and Eddie are saying. I mean, obviously we can't do what yeah. Jesus did, but what the Lord is asking us to do is what within our power, our power we are we able to do, do in terms of offering ourselves yes. to Him this is all and that we submitting have. to Him, and yeah. I think then I, Jesus does. Yeah. And I think that actually us. feeds into your question, Eric, about the ends of the law. Because yeah. right after 20, 24, right after 20, 23 there, He says, And notwithstanding we believe in Christ, we keep the law of Moses, and look forward with steadfastness unto Christ until the law shall be fulfilled. Taking back to 2 Nephi 2 here for a second, um, and seven, he offered himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Yeah. But, and so part of this, what we're doing here is this is pushing us to be contrite. Yes. The, the, what the, law, the ends of the law are to push Israel, to push the followers of Jehovah, to push the followers of Jesus Christ to be, to have a broken heart, a broken heart. and a contrite spirit. Mm -hmm. And not to, to none else. Can and, thus, the and, and thus we we connect ourselves with Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and our salvation then becomes a partnership. Uh, but keeping in mind that grace is not just the finishing touch to mm -hmm. top off no, our sure. own efforts. It, it really is the essence of salvation, which God and we participate in together. That's right. Perhaps to conclude this section of our discussion, or to this part of our discussion, we can direct our attention to verse 28 of 2 Nephi chapter 2, which is still part of Lehi's instruction to Jacob, and now becomes even more inclusive where he brings his other sons into the discussion. Verse 28, And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator, and hearken unto his great commandments, and be faithful unto his words, and choose eternal life according to the will of His Holy Spirit. I think we want to turn our attention now to uh, some more of Jacob's teachings in the Book of Mormon. Uh, Second Nephi 9 is a powerful, powerful chapter. And uh, I think you have a few things to tell us or say to us. One thing I think is, is to remember about this, and we already talked about previously, of course, is that Jacob is a priest ordained by his brother Nephi to function because he's not a Levite, but he's still functioning in a priestly role. And so there are notions of this reconciliation and priestly ideas behind this. One thing I really love, one of the great doctrines, Eric talked at the beginning about how much we owe the Book of Mormon for our understanding of what atonement is and how atonement works. One of the things I love about Second Nephi in particular is this is, Jacob really articulates for the first time our very important notion of physical and spiritual death. When we talk about those Latter-day Saints, that the atonement overcomes physical and spiritual death. We're really pulling from 2 Nephi 9 here. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment, which came upon man, must needs remain to an endless duration. And if so, this flesh, so physical death, must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth, to rise no more. 
And then, of course, 10. Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth the way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. And so he lays there that this is, the, this is solving two problems here, both our physical death and our spiritual death. Well, in a way, it touches upon a major theme throughout the Book of Mormon, and that's the concept of restoration. We're through the atonement of Jesus Christ, everyone will be resurrected. Everyone will be brought back into the presence of God, will be restored, even if it's only for a short time. So in our the spirits case of those restored who, to our bodies, and we are restored, restored to, to God's presence for exactly. judgment. Yeah, and, and that really is the apex, I think, the pinnacle of the doctrine of restoration, and we see restoration mentioned throughout the Book of Mormon text. One of the passages that I truly love, and I guess you could say I'm passionate about this one, is, uh, is Jacob's discussion about what would happen if there had been no resurrection. Verse 8, Oh, the wisdom of God, His mercy and grace! For behold, if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and became the devil to rise no more. And so what Jacob is going to tell us, basically, is that resurrection in and of itself is redemption. It's redemption from the clutches of Satan. It saves us from this uh, eternal degeneration, which would ultimately result in our becoming just like Satan or Lucifer. In fact, maybe we could say without the resurrection, all of us would be doomed to become just like sons of perdition. Yeah. Disembodied spirits separated from God. Exactly right. And so. This really is an amazing doctrine when you think about it. Resurrection in its, of itself is redemption, and it comes to everybody. We all know from Paul's discourse that everybody will be resurrected. It doesn't matter whether you're good or bad or whether you're tall or short or whatever. Everybody will be resurrected as a result of Jesus Christ, who was the first, first fruits of the resurrection. But even more than that, even if you don't repent, as a result of resurrection, you receive some kind of redemption. And as we're talking about atonement being everything Jesus does to make us like the Father, obviously we all have to overcome sin, we all have to overcome death, but there are those beautiful passages that perhaps some of our colleagues will treat, like in Alma 7, about the healing power of the atonement. And when I look at God, you know, my God is not depressed, and I'm depressed a good part of the time. And some people Jacob. struggle with, uh -huh. well, Nephi and Jacob yeah. do, yes. with chronic depression. And that's something that needs to be healed. I have a son, as some of you know, who has autism. Yeah. And that is a disability that will not be overcome in this life. But it will be in the resurrection. My God's not autistic. I mean, there are so many things that don't have to do with sin, but are part of mortality that the atonement heals, covers, yeah. draws together, makes whole. Can yeah. I just have us go really fast in Second Nephi 9 to just verse 19? Um, I just like that, that awful monster word that he uses there in the middle, um, the devil, but and death and hell. And so you've got the death there and the hell there. And for anybody that has physical challenges in this life that are not overcome, you do kind of experience a death. Right. regularly of shortcomings and shortfalls and things that and you experience a hell yes yeah. you know and so it's such a beautiful thing to bring all those together well it's even there in the in the next verse mm -hmm. or two he suffereth the pains of all men and women verse 21 yeah. yea the pains of every living creature both men and women and children and on that in verse 53 same chapter here kind of sort of one of his Jacob's summing up statements there kind of behold how great the covenants of the Lord this idea of covenant and law and relationship that we're trying to, this reconciliation back, this atonement, and how great his condescension is. that word again. There's There's that word it again. is. Under the children of men. And because of his greatness and his grace and mercy, and then he talks about, he's, he's promised that our seed shall not be destroyed. Again, this, this notion that the grace and mercy is not just, it's, it's so much bigger. Then we give, then we give it um, credit for so much. There's so much more involved, which I love. I love Jacob for these. Oh, how amazing this is! This is this is the greatest thing ever, and I love I love that. You know, we we, we covenant kind of sense with us, and all these great things because of His greatness and His grace and His mercy. So as we think about concluding our discussion this session together. I want to ask a question that I understand President Packer used to ask of his quorum members, the Quorum of the Twelve. After all we've said and after all we've heard, 
therefore what? What's the so what of the message that we've been talking about? Well, I uh, would like to take my answer out of Second Nephi 9, um, the rest of it. I mean, we've covered really well the beginning, um, but as we come to say chapter or verse 45 and, and in the end there, you see some more, oh, my beloved brethren, and more messages, but these pleadings of turn away from your sins, shake off the chains, come unto God, prepare your souls, and then verse 50, come my brethren, everyone that thirsteth, come, buy and eat, and then 51, do not spend money for that which is of no worth. So I think that Jacob gives us a lot of these, now what do we do? Well, we need to remember that when we're thinking about the atonement, it is body and soul, and it brings us back into the presence of God, where we will then have this conversation with him about what we've been doing. And so if we think of it as, if I'm always contemplating that, that return to God's presence, then I will make better decisions. Mm -hmm. I will come unto God. I will turn away from my sins. I will make my priorities what they need to be because I'm thinking about that moment down the road. And so we can all take that away of what can I do to make sure that when I'm returned to God's presence, that is a good experience for me. And it's something I look forward to having. And that is a fitting place for us to conclude this discussion. Thank you very much for a lively discussion and a very enlightening one. Appreciate it.